My name is Chris Ost, the clinical liaison for the inpatient rehab unit. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Robbie O'Brien Layton. Dr. Robbie is a graduate of the University of Kansas School of Medicine. She is a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician and completed her residency at Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Dr. Robbie grew up in western Kansas and returned to Kansas to be closer to family. Dr. Robbie O'Brien Layton has been the medical director of the inpatient rehab unit up on the fourth floor for the past year and a half. All right, thank you guys. Can you hear me well enough in the back? No. No? Stand, stand up. Is that better? I can move this a little bit too. Uh, many of you may, I gave a talk back in September of last year, so many of you may have, have met me um, or seen me then. Physical medicine and rehab is not a very um, large specialty, but we really focus on knowing about the nerves, the muscles, the bones. And then if somebody gets injured or you're born with um, some sort of issue, how to keep people functional throughout their lives, either from birth or as an accident happens or some disease process happens. And that's what I get to do now on inpatient rehab. I did outpatient for quite a while and now I'm really focusing on the inpatient side of that. The t uh, talk I'm going to do this time is really stroke recovery and more. And it's really just a collection of things that I might say to you or a family member or a friend if you came on the rehab unit with a stroke. Just some of the things that we kind of talk about, um, things that might help you to know about the, the course of stroke, how to recover, and how I'm looking at it as a rehab physician. So there should be plenty of time for questions after I'm finished. Um, but if there's something that you need to ask immediately, feel free to, to raise your hand and I can, I can get to that. But why do I want to talk about stroke? Because so many strokes occur in the year. I was looking up the statistics again just the last few nights and almost 800,000 Americans um, have a stroke every year and that's either a new stroke or a recurrent stroke. And 129,000 people die every year from a stroke. So it's a pretty big thing. It's the fifth leading cause of death. Um, so it's actually with our treatments, I think that has dropped. When I started residency, it was number three. So I think that it goes to you know early recognition of symptoms and treatment and prevention of, of complications. But it still remains the number one cause of disability in the United States. So it costs us a lot of money. It has a really big impact on people's lives and, and on the lives of those around them. So topics at a glance, they always tell me, well, kind of tell me what you're going to talk about. This is so hard because with stroke, there's so many things that you can talk about. These are kind of the things that I picked. Really, what types of strokes are there? There's some main types of strokes. And then really, stroke patterns or symptoms. Do you get hemiparesis? Do you have speech deficits? What kind of goes along with those stroke syndromes? Timing of recovery. That's what everybody wants to know. Am I going to get better? How quickly am I going to get better? And how completely? So I will try to answer that as best as I can. And then prevention of complications. So the stroke happens, but then a lot of things happen as a result of that stroke. And some of them are pretty immediate, and some of those are, are, are um, kind of along the course of things. And sometimes those complications can get in the way of somebody fully recovering. So how do we maximize uh, your health so that if you do have a stroke, if you recover, you can, can use that function? So what is a stroke? There's lots of different definitions. Uh, really, the one I like the best, it's a neurologic deficit that occurs when a blood vessel supplying the brain ruptures or is blocked. So we have lots of blood vessels going to our brain. Good news is we have some collateral circulation. Um, but if that's blocked off, you're going to get symptoms. Why? Because your brain needs nutrients and oxygen, and if it doesn't get it, you're going to start to have deficits. And a neurological deficit could be change in speech, could be confusion, could be vision changes, headache, dizziness, weakness, all of these things. Um, and why do we worry about that? Well, if it's temporary and that a perfusion uh, starts again and your, your blood, brain gets that blood flow, they may not cause any permanent damage. But if it, it stays there long enough, your cells are going to die. 
And that's kind of the problem with nerve cells. Once they hit a certain point, they're programmed for cell death. So it doesn't really matter what you do after that period, they're gonna go ahead and die. Um, so we try to get those ones that are sort of in that, maybe we can save them stage uh, the, the blood flow that they need. The other thing I need to let you know is this is a non-traumatic cause of a neurologic deficit. So if you fall and you hit your head, or um, that can cause similar symptoms depending on where that happened. That's different than a stroke. A stroke is a non-traumatic event that causes this, this deficit. I put this up here because I like this. I get asked a lot. Um, so what's a stroke and what's a TIA? A stroke can be anything that lasts more than a 24 hours. It has to last longer than 24 hours. A TIA, which is a transient ischemic attack, meaning there was some temporary change in blood flow, it's gone within 24 hours. And actually most TIAs last a minute or five minutes or less. They are very brief, they go away, you don't have any residual deficits. So somebody comes in and tells me, well, I had a mini stroke. And I say, well, how long did that mini stroke last? If it lasted three days or two weeks, it was a stroke. It's not a TIA, but I think a lot of times those get classified as TIA because people don't really know where to put those. Why do I worry about TIAs? Because a third of those people that have TIAs go on to have a stroke within that next year. So they can be a huge warning sign about what's, what's to come. And if there's things that we can do, you know, control blood pressure, those things to limit the risk of that stroke occurring, we need to be able to do that. What are risk factors for strokes? There's lots. I couldn't possibly put all of these up here. There are some that you can modify, some that you can't. We can't control how old we are, right? As we age, our risk goes up. At 55, the risk for stroke uh, dramatically increases, and then I think it doubles per decade after that. So it just continues to, to become more likely. Uh, hereditary, or uh, hered, um, gosh, inherited. If you get it from your family, I mean, if there's a high risk, you've got that risk, you can't really change that. We can modify things that go along with that, but if you've inherited it, it's your risk factor. Um, race or ethnicity. This one, uh, primarily uh, with white or black, if you're black, you have nearly a two-time risk of stroke uh, versus if you're white. Um, and and they, I don't know that they know exactly what that is. It may be because of uh, higher blood pressure, diabetes, those sorts of things, but there is this risk, it's, it's dramatic. And then when I was looking up um, in the last few days too, that those strokes, those people tend not to do as well. So that plays into it. I think really that's more just a hereditary piece that comes along with it, but we can kind of um, predict that a little better. Sex, I had to re look this up because I didn't believe it. When I started med school and residency, males were first. Males were at higher risk for stroke. I was kind of like, yay, something that women don't get. <laughs> Not true anymore. So it's actually females are at higher risk of stroke than males um, and, and seem to have more deaths due to strokes. And that may be due to a lot of different things. Um, I mean, age is one thing if you're living longer but also uh, smoking, uh, all the other risks that men used to seem to have, women have now too. And then if you do any sort of birth control, estrogen with smoking can really put you at a higher risk of, of blood clots and stroke and heart disease. A prior stroke or a TIA, like we uh, mentioned, you know, one third of somebody with a, or one third of the people with TIAs will have a stroke within that next year. High blood pressure, that causes most of our strokes at this point in time. Cigarette smoking, diabetes, atrial fibrillation. So I didn't put all the cardiac causes, but in atrial fibrillation, your, your heart's not beating smoothly, right? You've got part of your atria that's just sitting there quivering. Well, if you shake something and you shake our blood that has clotting factors in it, it likes to form blood clots. And then those like to travel throughout your body. Well, the most likely place for that to go is your brain, and your brain doesn't like it because it doesn't get blood flow. And then high cholesterol. A lot of the things that cause heart disease are at risk. High cholesterol builds up plaque in your blood vessels, narrows those blood vessels, so there's less flow, and it takes a smaller clot to um, prevent blood flow. So what are the types of strokes? There's really two main types, hemorrhagic and ischemic. 
So the hemorrhagic ones are the ones where your blood vessels rupture, and the ischemic are everything else, where there was a clot and you didn't get the blood flow to where it needed to be. That vessel is still intact. The hemorrhagic ones we worry about, those are why you really get rushed to CT right away, because we want to see if there's a bleed. If there's a bleed, then the last thing we want to do is give you something to um, prevent blood clotting, right? We'll make that bleed worse. Um, so that's why you go to CT. The two types of um, hemorrhagic really can happen primarily by uncontrolled hypertension, typically causes the, the blood vessels uh, to rupture, um, or aneurysm. So the ones about, the interesting thing about uncontrolled high blood pressure, you always like to think, well, they were exercising, they were doing something crazy, right? Their blood pressure got out of control and they ruptured. And that's not always the case. It's usually, it's an overtime wear and tear and people can be at rest and this happens. The aneurysms, they're the ones that, and most people don't know that they have a, an aneurysm in their a blood vessel in their brain, but when they're exercising, that can often happen, um, and they have these strokes. So a lot of those people can actually die because of that, that bleeding, but those are the two aneurysms. The ischemic, which is what you see the most of the time, um, really is where the blood vessel's blocked, and then it just depends on where is it blocked, what caused the blockage, you can kind of classify it. I think I put a couple of different types up there, thrombotic, embolic, and lacunar. I'm not going to quiz you guys on these. I don't think you need to know these. But you might hear your physician mention this, or if you ever get a report, it might have that in there. And the thrombotic just means really a thrombus or a blood clot formed. And that can just be if the blood vessel wall is uneven because you've got plaque from the cholesterol or it's damaged. We always have platelets, right, in our blood. They're great because if we cut our skin, they form a clot. Well, that whole cascade can happen in our body too. And if there's an uneven area or something that can trigger it to, to form a clot, that can happen. So that's where you get your thrombotic ones. Now, our blood is also equipped with things to break down clots because it knows that can happen, so it can break those. And that's why TIAs can be there and then be gone. Embolic are really the ones and most common are the heart throwing those blood clots. But if you're sick enough, you have sepsis, um, or you have like an infection on your heart valve, you can be throwing bacterial clots too. Do the same thing, or cholesterol, um, it'd be possible some, if you break a bone, it can throw um, fat throughout your body and, and cause similar things. But the number one cause of embolic stroke is typically a blood clot from your heart. And then lacunar, which are the tiny little ones. And those aren't the major blood vessels to your brain getting clotted. It's the, the, the end of those blood vessels where they get really small. Things just get wedged. Those give you little strokes. And most of the time, people get over those pretty quickly. But they're named lacunar, which just means little lake. When we image these, they're just these little isolated spots. So the American... Um, Stroke Association, there's a really big push to uh, educate people on, on stroke symptoms. So I put this slide in there. You may see these up somewhere. They've done um, commercials. If you go online, you'll see this. And this really is recognizing stroke. We need to recognize stroke so that we can treat stroke. And so the, the acronym that they're using is FAST. So what, what could I look for for a stroke? Not everybody's stroke presents this way, but facial drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulty. That doesn't mean they have to slur the words, but people are, can be confused and not making sense. Garbled speech, that all counts. And then um, time to call, so call 911. And why do we want to do all this? Well, it's really the hemorrhagic strokes, yes, because if we need to do some sort of surgical intervention if they're bleeding so much to get that pressure off the brain, but it's really the ischemic ones, the ones that have had a blood clot, because there's this drug called TPA, tissue plasmin, plasminogen activator that can lyse those clots. But to be a candidate to get that TPA, you have to show up um, within three hours. So they have to be administering that within three hours of the onset of stroke. And that can be a challenge, especially if you're not close to a facility. Like where I grew up in, in Western Kansas, I mean, it's a drive, right? To get to the hospital, then they'd have to evaluate you and then send me to another hospital before they could potentially even give me that treatment. So the sooner you see the symptoms and get to the hospital, that allows different treatment options. TPA has been around um, since 1995. They did a study, and what they really found is the people that got this TPA, which lyses clots, 
about they had a 30% more likely minimal or no disability at three months. So they said, hey, this is a good thing. Now there's risk with TPA, right? If you shoot something into your body that's gonna lie clots, you could potentially have bleeding in other areas. So there are some things that exclusion criteria. One of those would be, I mean, if you had low platelets already and weren't a good clotter, they're not gonna do that. But that's really for the neurologist to kind of figure out what to do. But FAST is, I think, a really good thing, right? So facial droop, any sort of change in face, um, any change in speech, any sort of weakness, arm or leg, call and get somebody to the emergency room. There are other things that can cause symptoms of stroke, but they all need to be treated. I mean, they're gonna check for hypoglycemia because that's one thing that can do the same thing, but um, get them to the hospital. So patterns of stroke symptoms. There's so many things I could mention. There's so many stroke syndromes that I didn't really wanna go over that, but really go over some basic things that, that know that the motor area of your brain typically controls the opposite side of your body. So if somebody says they had a left-sided stroke, I sometimes have to clarify, do you mean the stroke was in the left side and your right side is affected, or no, my left side was affected, so the stroke was in my right hemisphere. So that can be confusing and that can confuse people. Sometimes it can affect both hemispheres if it's a big enough stroke or location. But that's why I put the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body, just to, to um, remind you of that. The other thing about the left side of the brain is our language center sits on that side. So if you have a stroke on the left side of your brain, you may get the right-sided weakness, the hemiparesis, but you may have more speech difficulties than if you had this similar stroke on the right side of your body. If you have a stroke in your brainstem, it's kind of an interesting thing. It can, it can control both sides of the body, um, same side of the body. So a brainstem stroke can really affect both sides of the body. And then your, your cerebellum is really kind of helps coordination and balance. So you may not have a lot of weakness, but you may have trouble controlling your arm or your leg. So you go to reach for something and it just flies out wherever you don't want it to, right? Or same thing with your leg, you try to put it down in front of you and it kicks out really crazily, or you're just, you're shaking, you can't hit that target. And those can be very disabling impairments and sometimes more frustrating than just being weak because somebody can see weakness, right? They can see that you have hemiparesis. If you look like your muscles are okay and you're holding your arm fine, they often don't recognize how impaired you might be. The other thing I wanted to mention was the importance of both strength and sensation. So before I went to medical school, or even in medical school, before I got into residency, I would have told you what's the thing I want back most if I had a stroke? My power. I want my strength back. Give me my strength, I'll be fine. That's not really true. You need sensation as well. Those two go really, really hand in hand. Because if you get control of your arm or your leg, but you cannot feel where it is in space, it's not much good to you. Unless you're constantly watching it, you can't get it to go where you want. Our, our limb is constantly, our nerves are constantly sending feedback to our brain where this is. How, hold do I, how hard do I hold a cup without crushing it or dropping it? All of that is sensation dependent. So we really need sensation. And that's what I'm kind of seeing with some of our strokes and with uh, TPA, they're doing very well and they're getting their motor back, but the sensation is kind of lagging behind. So great, I've got this arm or this leg that can move and I think I should be able to walk or do these things, but I can't because my brain is not recognizing it in the way that it should and I can't control the movement like I want. So I can get up to stand, but if I'm not constantly watching that foot or I go to reach for this, that leg gives way. It can really kind of take more time to recover than I think they might think or family members would because they can say, look, they sit down, they can move the limb. But really sensation is a huge part of movement. You need both. So we're constantly watching that sensation return. It doesn't have to be normal, but you need some sensation to really help you control movement. I wanted to bring up pseudo bull bar affect. So that's your, your $10 word or $100 word or whatever, PBA. It's emotional lability. And we see it with stroke, it gets different terms over time. A pseudo bull bar um, affect right now is kind of the, the end term. But what does that mean? Well, if you've ever been around somebody who's had a stroke, especially early on, they may just burst out into laughter or tears and they wouldn't have normally done that. 
And sometimes it might be something that's funny, but they just get really tickled at it and can't figure out why. But it's, it is, it's just really kind of an, a sudden outburst of uncontrollable laughing or crying. The person cannot stop it, it happens. Usually on rehab, we see that get better within the first few weeks or so, but it can hang on for a long, long time. And for some people, it doesn't go away. We think that's somewhere between the, the frontal lobes that control emotion and your brain stem and, and um, cerebellum all kind of controlling that, that that loop, is, it's messed up and it can't, it can't uh, control it like it should. So if you're talking with somebody who has a stroke and there's something sad and they just start crawling, uh, crying uncontrollably doesn't necessarily mean that they're that upset about what was said or that they're depressed. It's just this roller coaster that they're on. And really understanding that can kind of help them feel better too because people get self-conscious like, I'm laughing, or what if you laugh at something that's not really funny but you can't stop it, right? That can be very socially inappropriate. So it does get better over time. There are some medicines that may help it if it persists, but it's a normal part typically of, of stroke. So dysphagia, that's another thing that can happen. Dysphagia, sometimes I said it dysphagia in residency and now um, it's dysphagia. Depends really where you're at, but you hear both of those terms. As long as it's got a G, it means trouble with swallowing, okay? There's three phases really of your swallow. Your oral phase, your pharyngeal phase, which is kind of the back of your throat, upper part of your neck and then the esophageal phase. And really it's just if your muscles are weak, you can't control your swallow, your um, epiglottis may not close to protect your airway, and you're at risk to get aspiration pneumonia or the food going into your lungs rather than down into your stomach. It kind of makes sense if you think about it. I mean, if your face is weak and you can't smile, how well are you going to be able to hold food in there, chew it, and move that food backwards? The other thing is we talked about sensation in your arm and your leg. Have a numb face. If you've ever had to have dental procedures and they've numbed your face, you try to eat, I mean, you can't, it spills out. That's what somebody with a stroke is dealing with, and so it can be a frustrating and, and a dangerous thing as well. We can modify diets, so you can get put on a softened diet where they chop it up or they puree it. They can thicken liquids. All thickening the liquid does is slow down how fast that liquid moves and give you a little more time, your, your mouth and, and throat, a little more time to process that swallow. Oftentimes, the, you have a weak cough if your mouth, if all these muscles for swallow, um, so you're really at risk of a pneumonia because if I might swallow and get this into the wrong place, my protection is a good cough. And if I can't cough well, then I, I'm really at risk. And so that's why if you come to the rehab unit, a lot of times people with swallowing issues, we don't want them to eat while they're lying down. They have to really be sitting up tall. Um, Take one bite at a time slowly, limit the distractions, because if you're trying to eat and talk at the same time, it doesn't work well. And it puts you at risk for dehydration, especially if, we, if, you, if you've ever eaten a pureed diet. I mean, applesauce is good, but pureed meat, really not so good. At least I, I don't like it. Um, and thickened liquids aren't aren't very delicious either. I mean, some of the juices thickened are okay, but if you thicken water, I think it's like drinking snot. It, it's gross. It's this gooey, not quite right thing, and nobody wants to drink it, so you get dehydrated. Um, and if you're diabetic, you can't drink sweetened things all the time, so it really gets to be a challenge. And if you're dehydrated, you don't have energy, and you don't want to do the things you need to do, and can affect your, your kidney function. So bowel and bladder function. I just wanted to, to touch on this because this doesn't get mentioned much with stroke and people thinking, oh, I had a stroke. I'm sure my bowel and my bladder aren't going to work well. I think I'd be really surprised. I'd say, what? I never see that on the commercials, right? <laughs> but about 30% of people have some bowel incontinence right after their stroke. The good news is that that usually goes away within two weeks. So it's just that idea of like, oh my gosh, I didn't have awareness. I have to go and now I've got to go and I can't get there it gets better. It can be embarrassing for people right out, uh, initially, but on rehab, we've seen everything. We kind of expect that to happen, and it, it's just a process. If we need to, we can start on some sort of a program to help control, control that, but usually it goes away. Bladder dysfunction is a little more common and may last a little longer. So the reference that I used said about 50 to 70% of people may have some bladder issues, and usually that's incontinence too. Um, 
typically that you go when you don't want to, but sometimes it's over um, overflow incontinence where your bladder is so full and you don't know you need to go. And then when you get up or you strain or you cough, then you leak. That one's probably the most damaging because that can increase the pressures of the urine back up kidneys and cause kidney damage. But we watch for that. And, and even this usually within a month goes away. So we oftentimes put people on bladder schedules or training like the nurse comes in and says, you need to go every two hours. Even if you say, well, I don't feel like it, they're gonna say, tough, we're going, right? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to, to train that bladder again to work right, to reset its sensor so it knows when, when full is full. Um, but the good news is most of those go away. And I think that's why really they don't get much coverage because they get better. It's not like the swallowing, the speech problems, the weakness that you see that kind of lasts longer and longer. So recovery from stroke. This is usually what people ask me and they want to know. And I wish I could tell you, yeah, everybody recovers and I can tell you when and how much. We don't really know. I mean, the good news is the, the more quickly you're recovering, the more completely you're going to recover. Most recovery typically happens within that first year. Doesn't mean it will ever stop. Um, and actually, if you look closer, a lot of that recovery, the big recovery may happen within the first three months. There's always exceptions to those rules if you have other health problems and other things going on. But we really want to kind of get on that recovery. Um, legs tend to recover more quickly and more completely than arms. That's good and bad. I mean, if it's your right side that's dominant and you use your right hand all the time and it's really, really weak, and you're gonna to have to become a lefty, that can be frustrating. But from my rehab standpoint, I want a leg that can get you around. Because if you can get up and walk and have one hand, you're much more independent than one leg and two arms. It, it's just typically easier to be able to stand and to walk. So that's what I remind people. And then that you can continue your OT as an outpatient. People get really, really good though at doing things one-handed or using that other hand as an assist. The occupational therapists are, are great at teaching different techniques and what works for one person might not work for another person. Typically, if we're talking about hemiparesis, which would be one side of the body's affected, if they're both pretty uh, significantly affected, your leg's gonna come back before your arm. Um, what you normally see is initially after a stroke, kind of this period of what we call a uh, flaccid or fl um, where you're just weak, you can't move at all, and you lose your muscle tone. Typically, within, you may even lose your reflexes. Within two days, you're getting reflexes back. That tone may be coming back. And when we first see movement in your arm or your leg, it's usually at the shoulder or at the hip. And most of those are kind of gross motor movements or what we call synergy patterns. So our brain really goes back to kind of basic movement patterns that we had when we were newborns. And, and kind of goes through that pattern. So you'll flex, like you may lift your shoulder up, but you'll notice your arm and your hand, everything wants to kind of flex up. That's usually the first movement. Same thing with your hip, you get hip flexion, knee and, and foot flexion. And then over time, you may start to be able to extend out. At first, those muscles move in a group, which can be frustrating, right? I just wanna grip something with my hand and here comes my whole arm. Um, that gets better over time. As you get more isolated control, you can move outside of synergy. I will take synergy though, if I know that to stand up, I need my knee to lock. So what comes with when you straighten your hip, your knee locks, a stiff leg is a stable leg. So we can use that to stand and to transfer and to even to walk. So if you never get isolated control back, that's okay. But typically, yeah, you have this weak period where you don't move, you start to get tone back. Then you usually get movement proximal, so shoulder, hip, before you see stuff down at the, the distal end in your hand or your foot. And typically it's kind of this motor pattern of all these groups of muscles moving together. And then you start to get individual or isolated movement of those muscles. There's a little thing that can sneak in though called spasticity, which is hypertonicity, all sorts of names for it. But it's increased muscle tone, out of normal. So when you have a stroke, our brain is really good at regulating what's normal muscle tone, right? When my muscle's at rest, how loose or how stiff should it be? With stroke, you can get too stiff. That loop can kind of just feed back on itself and you can't break it up and, and you can get really tight. So you've seen people probably with strokes that get stuck in some sort of position. That's hypertonicity. A lot of people, as they recover, recover movement, that tone goes away, but for some people it doesn't. 
And that can really be a problem because it can cause contractures or it can get in the way of, of your active movement that you have in that limb. So spasticity is in there. We like to think it gets better as you get your movement back. If we're looking at hand function, I really want to try to see a grip within a month. Because if you can get a good grip within a month, then I can be pretty confident saying you're going to have good hand function, right? If you have a go a long time and you don't get any movement in that side, then, then the recovery or the complete recovery really kind of goes down the chance of that. Most people start moving usually within that first week to 30 days after a stroke. If you don't, then I start to wonder how much of that will come back. Now the good news is on rehab, we can teach you to do all those things with a hemi technique. So one side of the body, and I've seen a lot of people that are very independent, only having use of one side of the body. Um, so that's what we work towards and we wait to see what comes back. Now everybody's an exception, so I don't want you thinking, oh, if it doesn't, it won't come back. No, it can if you just look at big groups. That's kind of to give you an, an idea of what to hope for. And sometimes I use that so that if you're really holding off on learning how to do something because you're waiting for this hand to come back and we're a month or six weeks out and this hand hasn't moved, I can say statistically, I don't think that hand's coming back or not to the level that you think. We need to be talking about maybe some adaptive equipment or learning, being open to learning a different technique. So let's do this while we wait on this hand, but I don't want to delay anymore. On rehab, we have really short stays. Acute rehab, strokes used to get seven weeks or more. And now really I'm down to if you need a lot of assistance, like total assistance to max assistance, meaning you're only doing 25% of your transfer, I get maybe three to four weeks. That's not a lot of time to try to get somebody to recover or to use the expertise of my therapist to really help you in that. So sitting and waiting for something to come back is really not an option um, at, a, at the acute inpatient rehab level. So complications that can happen, I've sort of mentioned some of these. One is deep venous thrombosis. So fancy word for a blood clot in your vein. That can happen any time we're less active or less mobile. Our blood, if it doesn't move, likes to clot. If you've had trauma to blood vessels, that's also a trigger. So if you've had a stroke and you used to be walking, and I don't mean that you have to be running marathons, but if you were up moving and now you're stuck in bed, that's a huge change in movement and you're at risk for blood clots. So we do different things, those tight TED hose, those white hose, if you've ever had them on, that's what those are supposed to help do. Um, the other thing is if you're not moving your arm or your leg, edema can set in. So gravity likes to pull, I mean blood flows down. Normally us pumping our muscles and raising our arm or our leg help that fluid to flow back to the heart. If we don't move it, it just swells. Well swelling also causes an increased risk. So the edema, uh, the TED hose help keep the swelling down. And then we have those SCDs, those sequential compression devices that squeeze your legs at night that tries to help with that blood flow. And then if we need to, you are often put, you may get a, like a Lovenox shot or some sort of blood thinner shot um, to help decrease that risk. Because the last thing I want is a blood clot in your leg, which delays us being able to get you out of bed. Or worse, if that blood clot travels to your lungs and then you've got a pulmonary embolism and trouble breathing. Um, urinary tract infections. So we talked about the bladder dysfunction. Really, your, your biggest risk is probably within that period when that bladder is not emptying right. Bacteria loves warm, moist environments, and the bladder would qualify as that. We're protected in some ways because we empty our bladder frequently, you flush that out, so even if there's bacteria in there, they don't really get a chance to grow. But if you're holding urine too long in your bladder, or when you empty your bladder, you only get it half emptied, and there's that urine still sitting there kind of just cooking, right, growing more bacteria, you're at risk of a, a bladder infection. So UTIs are kind of a, a, a big issue. We try to get on that. And if they happen, they tend to cause confusion and lack of energy, which can really slow stroke recovery. So that's, again, a, a plug for like the voiding schedules. And we'll ultrasound bladders to see if are they emptying completely what's happening there. Aspiration pneumonia, we already talked about. If you have trouble swallowing, that food may not go where it's supposed to. And then our protection is a good cough. And after stroke, oftentimes we don't have a good cough. Or if we do, it's not after we've been to therapy, right, and we're tired. So um, 
really following like if you need to be on swallowing precautions, sitting up, those sorts of things. We also give you that incentive spirometer. I don't know if anybody's used that, the lovely plastic thing where you suck and you make the, the yellow piece float. That keeps your lungs inflated. Atelectasis or your lungs kind of collapsing because you're not taking deep breaths puts you at risk because again there's another warm moist environment that bacteria loves to hang out in. Joint contractures, we talked about spasticity, how that can get tight. But any limb, if it doesn't move, can get contracted. Hands get stiff really, really quickly. So just making sure that you're continuing to move these joints to keep motion. When you get movement back, you wanna be able to, to move that joint. It's frustrating if your hand's stuck, right? And now I've got movement, but my joint is stuck. The other thing you have to make sure is that how you range this. I've seen a lot of people with strokes just grab with their finger and pull this hand all over. Well, they're not feeling this hand, but this hand joint is not really meant to lift our entire arm. And I can do it right now because my muscles in my shoulder know to help me out. But if I'm not kicking that, then all this weight and you, you're causing trauma to your joints. So the OTs will cringe if, if you're doing that. So they'll be like, grab your wrist. So just having a knowledge of how to move my limb so that I'm not causing damage. Um, sometimes we'll split people to keep you in a good position so that you don't tighten up overnight so that we have that motion available. And, and splinting is, can be lifelong. Even if you don't get movement back, I wanna preserve range of motion. It's a lot easier to dress a limb that can move than one that's stuck at my side like this, right? It's a real challenge to get something over it or to clean in my hand if I can't get my hand open to wash. So th that's a plug for, for always for splinting. Uh, even in the leg to splint sometimes too to make sure that you can get 90 degrees at your um, ankle so that your foot can sit on a foot plate nicely and not get a sore. Or that if you do stand on that foot, you're not standing on your toes on that side. It helps with balance. Injury to limbs, there's really a couple of different ways. One is neglect, which is where your brain does, doesn't even really recognize that side of your body exists. And if you don't know that, you can be running into things, you can do all sorts of things with your left or your right side of your body. The other thing is, if you can't feel this arm, even if I know it's there, if I can't feel it and I go to get up out of bed, I might be sitting up and saying, oh, where's my arm? Well, it's tangled in the covers behind me, right? What did I just do to my shoulder and my elbow? So you can really injure yourself by just not having that awareness or, oh, I sat down. Okay, where's your hand? Oh, I'm sitting on it, right? And if you're not getting those, the, the, and, and you, it may sound unbelievable, but it happens. And normally our brain says, ow, that hurts and get off of it. But if it doesn't, you really have a tr trouble. Or at night, if you sleep on your arm and you don't get that, hey, wake up, this is hurting, roll over, you can have issues. So you can have injury to limbs, so really education on awareness. And if, if the patient is not able to, to have that awareness, then teaching family members and friends to kind of help with that. Falls are always a risk, so um, poor balance, weakness, impaired sensation. I didn't talk about attention, but lots of times your attention can be limited after stroke. Your brain is working so hard to do these simple movements that it doesn't have a lot of ability to really focus on anything else or boom, I get distracted and then I fall. One of the ways, I mean, we do that up on rehab as an assistive device. So most people after strokes learn to walk with a walker. And then as your balance improves, we may get you to a cane and then without an assistive device. And just knowing that you need to slow down, which can be a challenge if you're in a hurry to get to the bathroom, right? Your reaction is, I wanna get up and run to the bathroom. That's where our falls always occur. Uh, on a rehab unit, we don't like people getting up and walking unless the staff has cleared them to do so because so many falls occur. Um, and you may not even be aware that you're struggling, especially in the sleep when you wake up and, and things aren't moving very well. And then the other thing I want to talk about briefly is depression. About a third to two thirds of people who um, survive stroke have depression at some period during their course, course. And it's natural for your mood to be down, right? It should be down. If you're like, woohoo, this stroke happened to me, I'm so lucky, then I start to think that maybe you're not realistic. Right, I mean, it sucks. Nobody wakes up and says, I, I want to drool. I want to have to have somebody take me to the bathroom or I can't dress. And, and if you're really independent and you, this is the first time you have to depend on others, it, it's really life altering. And if you're married, I mean, your role as the spouse may really change, you know. So 
All of those things are natural. Mood can be down, and I'm not worried about that. And we've talked about that pseudo bulbar affect, right, where you can cry or laugh at times where you don't want to. But if your mood starts to get down to the point where you don't want to engage in therapy or activities that you wanted to enjoy or you stop eating, that's when we really need to address it. I don't want the mood to be what gets in the way of full recovery. And sometimes that can happen. So just watch those loved ones. Because um, lots of times the patient themselves doesn't realize that maybe they're having all those symptoms. They're just like, well, I've had a stroke. I can't, I can't do this stuff. Oh, I'm talking less. And they don't realize some of those things. Um, so keep an eye out for that because that can really undo a lot of, a lot of good things. And, and you have to be motivated to recover from a stroke because it's work. And not every day do you feel like working that hard, but you, you really need to. Um, and then caregiver burnout, I didn't put up there, but I really think that that can be a complication following stroke because now you're really depending on somebody else to do all of this and, and they need to be taking their breaks. And as a rehab doctor who used to do outpatient, so many of my patients with strokes learned to do a lot of great things in rehab, but when they got home, they say, well, my spouse can do that for me. They can't but that might wear them out and they may be able to do it better or faster but you lose function if you stop moving as much as you did before so really trying to get the patient to do more and then saying that if i can't do this all alone how do how do i get some help in there or get some breaks there are a lot of websites out there uh, the american stroke association i think is a good resource that's where i got that fast um, slide from they have a lot of if you want any of these things that I covered they really go more in depth they have more stuff on caregivers or returning to you know life after stroke you could talk in for hours I think about stroke but this this is really kind of what you would hear from me kind of as a bedside as I was coming in and, and answering questions that's really all I have today so I'll open it up for any questions Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to know if the smell uh, has anything to do with it. If you're not getting enough air in your nose, to, to smell the things. If, if smell has anything to do with uh, having, a having a stroke? I mean, you can't smell something. Uh huh. So if you're smelling, you're not, oh, if you're not getting enough air to support everything else, I, I wish, you know, I haven't seen anything. Our, our nose, our, those cells are really kind of long and, and pr um, prone to injury. I've, I've not seen that. I mean, if you're not getting good oxygenation or breathing trouble, that could put you more at risk. So I didn't talk about sleep apnea and some of those, but I've not noticed about smell unless it was a change of, oh, I could smell really well. And then boom, all of a sudden I can't smell anything that might tell me something nerve wise is going on but at this point i don't think it really just not being able to smell really is not correlated well with air movement or oxygenation of your blood all right who else has questions here would you talk some more about tias and recovery and so TIAs really you recover from those um, within a minute or a few minutes and you may have several of those in a day or some people have a TIA and within the same day have a stroke. So if you've had a TIA you really need to go to the emergency room because I don't know if that big stroke is coming that day or not. And they're going to do a workup and they're going to look at your risk factors and they're going to say do you need to be on aspirin or, or um, Plavix or some sort of blood thinner. Um, to, to help with that, and it is a risk factor for a, a stroke maybe coming. But those should not leave any neurologic um, deficits. So if you tell me, oh, I've got a little weakness from that TIA, then it, it wasn't a TIA. You had a little stroke. Is that uh, TIA, is that when you suddenly kind of wake up, you're, you're headed down and then you wake up, all of a sudden you don't know what's happened? What is a TIA? How do you know if you have one? So a transient ischemic attack can just be any time you have any neurologic deficit. So it could be right, you're sleepy, you got confused, your speech wasn't quite right for a minute or two. Yep, and then it, and then it improves, typically within a few minutes. But any, any deficit that improves within 24 hours, so in, that lasts less than a day, is considered a TIA. 
So it's not quite a stroke, but it's almost there. And sometimes the, the person may not realize it's happening. Their friend may say, you're kind of talking funny. Really? I, you know, and they, you may not notice. So it's kind of hard. Um, or if you've been at home alone, you don't know how long were those symptoms lasting before I kind of woke up. But they're, they're brief and they go away. No, no long-term uh, damage or deficit from them. In the middle of a TIA, how high does your blood pressure go? <laughs> Typically with stroke, your blood pressure elevates. I didn't talk about that. Um, it goes pretty high. Depends on, you know, if it's a hemorrhage or not. And we don't get super worried. We want those blood pressures down. But after a stroke, we want good blood flow. And we really look at what your uh, cerebral pressures or blood flow is. And it's, it's figured out of a different formula. But we typically let your blood pressures run a little higher than normal right after a stroke just to make sure your brain is getting good blood flow. But yeah, they're high. If I'm in the middle of a TIA, also, should I be taking aspirin? Because does it that slow me down in order to be able to get the shock? Right. And so, I mean, as long as I know it's not hemorrhagic, it's great to take an aspirin. But when the TIA, if it starts, I may not know if it's hemorrhagic or not. Um, I'd like to think that the hemorrhagic ones are really quick and all of a sudden you're really bad. <coughs> But there is a risk to that. So usually trying to get a hold of your doctor or get to the ER to ask them, um, I wouldn't necessarily take that aspirin. I didn't see that on the um, American uh, Stroke Association. They really said, just call. Call 911 and let them kind of direct you what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Yes. And just so you guys know, uh, we will not be having one in December. I think he's to go into a question back there, and then I'll get you. On the balance issues that you have, I had a moderate stroke. I wasn't expecting the balance issues or the weakness, but I did feel the big old movement in the other side of the on that side. Do you guys come back pretty readily? I mean, come back to other ways. The balance, thing, I guess the balance can sometimes be tricky and hang on for a long time, especially from like cerebellar strokes. It, it, can, it does improve. It may not go away. You may get strength back, but that balance sort of kind of linger on. We can try to compensate that for that by some by getting your trunk really strong so that if it's stable, you're not swaying as much. Um, working on that sensation, doing some balance exercises. but. It will get better, but it may never go away, and you may always know that there's just that little bit of balance issue there. So being aware on uneven surfaces or when it's slick, uh, that those are those are more challenging times. Okay. Did you have a question? Yes, I have had a stroke. I have had a stroke um, that didn't leave me with a lot of problems, but um, one time when I was and this is years ago. One time when I was recently, when I was brushing my teeth, I got extremely dizzy and had to go to the floor because I didn't go to the doctor. Oh, no. Does that, is that a sign that? It could be, actually, yeah. So severe dizziness um, can be a sign, and nausea, vomiting, um, hearing loss eye pain, all of those can be signs of stroke, probably not as typical as, as what we see on that fast, but they, it can happen. Now, heart arrhythmias can do that, blood pressure and blood sugars can do that, migraines, so you, you really need to go in or, or call your doc and say, hey, this happened, right? Because if you've had a history of stroke, they're gonna wanna make sure that you're doing everything that you can to prevent another stroke, so controlling the blood pressure, controlling your cholesterol, and potentially a blood thinner if you're at risk for you know, not that I know of, but I will tell you, I didn't probably look at the I didn't look at the literature specifically for that. That's not one of those main risk factors up there. Um, if I mean any abnormal anatomy in your brain could potentially, I suppose, lead to an increased risk of stroke, but not that I know of. Concussion's not one of those big ones that I've ever really learned about? It's a good question. Dr. 
I had to kind of lead you up to mine. I had knee replacement surgery. About an hour later, I had a heart attack. I'm still in the hospital. I made it through that, and in a couple of days, they sent me across the street to Dill's Living Center for rehab. And two weeks later, I'm sitting in the bathroom, and the aide is putting my socks and shoes on, and why these two nurses walked in just to watch. And one of them said, oh my God, and just shot out of the room. She saw that I was having a stroke. Mm -hmm. Within 10 minutes, I was in the hospital, and they were talking about the shot that they said there was three, three possibilities. You'd get better, you'd get worse, or nothing changed. <laughs> and uh, apparently nothing changed. Uh, as far as I know, I have no residuals from it. Good. But th those are, you know, that was a trying thing. And of course, those can, I suppose, bring on, I don't know whether I had a PIA or or genuine stroke because they treated it so quickly. Yeah, you treat it quickly, we may not know, right? And we were better afterwards. So did the TPA work or was it just a TIA? Yeah, I had to sign the one. They said they didn't count them. They're nothing more. Right. So I had to sign. Right. They even make it worse. There's a, a risk of bleeding yeah. with that. So you have to know that there is a risk with that. but. I think when you're left with, look what's happening, do I want that chance of getting better? A lot of people will, will, will take that chance. Can you hear me? Oh. For years, Wolfman or Covenant has been used to treat AFib. I see a lot of advertisement on television of another drug that I've heard is controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no, uh, no need to take a monthly blood test, diet restricted, so on. Do you have an opinion about the new drug or drugs as compared to warfarin and coumadin? You know, there's benefits and pros and cons, I think, to both. Warfarin is, is very affordable, right? And we know what it does. But the downside to it is you have to get it checked. And if you change your diet or another medicine can really interfere with it, um, your levels can change. And so that can be cumbersome, especially if you can't get to somewhere where you can monitor your, your blood. And the risk is if it's too thin, too high, right, you can just bleed really easily or spontaneously. Or if it's too low, it's not doing its job. So there's several drugs out there now that you can take that work on that clotting cascade. And the, the attractive thing about them, right, is no monitoring. So people like that. And, and I think that's good. The problems with it right now, one is it's very expensive. And two, if I need to reverse that anticoagulation, there's not a good reversal. So it is what it is until it wears off. So if something happens and I need to reverse your Coumadin, I can do that, I can give you vitamin K. And within a short period of time, I can take you to surgery or we, you know, we can help with stopping that bleeding. And with those other drugs, there's not. They, they throw a lot of different clotting factors at it that um, we have but none of them are really good. So that's kind of the concern that I can't reverse it if I need to when you come in. I just have to say, well, it's half-life is this. I've just got to let it run its course. So that's, I think, what the doctors are kind of really looking at. And until they can get a reversal for that, there's going to be some people that are not appropriate. And the cost is a, is a huge thing, too. The, it's really expensive, but you will see people now with knee replacements and stuff, rather than having to go on Coumadin for those short-term times when they were getting DVT prophylaxis for, you know, anywhere from two weeks to six weeks, depending on your joint, that they may go home with taking a pill once a day that you don't have to get your lab work monitored. That's really slick, right? Versus here's this drug, and then we've got to keep changing it on you because you've not taken it for or before, and we don't know how that's, that's going to play out. So. I think it just depends on the situation. There's there's pros and cons to both. We still use warfarin quite a bit, and I don't see it going away in the near future. Okay, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. If you guys have any other questions, please come to the front and ask. And uh, 
Well, we want to thank you again for coming out. We really enjoy your presence. And uh, once again, in December, we're not going to be uh, having a first quarter. So uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thank, thank you. you.